Hallelujah. Well, I've said hallelujah three times thinking I was on the air. So, <laughs> so, so I want to welcome everybody back to the 11th hour today. It's been a good day already. It's going to get better and better and better. Amen. Amen. Well, I wanted to speak to, before we do anything else, I wanted to tell uh, Tony that you are a blessed person. The Lord has blessed you right there. And there's somebody, I think your name is Alfred. Maybe, maybe that's the way it's, uh, uh, what I'm hearing. But I wanted to tell you the Lord has got you on his mind. Amen. And it's going to be a good time. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. There was Tony and Alfred and Nancy and who else? Yes. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to, uh, to listen to something for just a moment. And I, I want to try to, um, to just get this said in a, in a way. I'm trying to find a certain scripture for you. It's in Matthew 24, verse 37. And um, listen to what this says. Matthew 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now it says, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in this days or those times, in the days of Noah, they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, and the day that until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, yeah, well, we'll just read on just a little bit. It said, then two shall be in the field, then one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. You know, it's amazing to me how the Lord, how, how he People say, well, he taught on a third grade level to us. Well, that would have been so that man could understand him. He's God in the flesh. And so, but you know what? It was amazing the mysteries that he would speak in scriptures like this and prophetic things. Because he said, in the day the Lord returns, he said, there'll be two uh, in the field working. Listen to how he said this. He said, two will be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left, two uh, shall be grinding at the mill, and one shall be taken, and the other left. I think one says that uh, one of the accounts says that two will, uh, will be sleeping, one taken, the other left. And he begins to talk about nobody in that day knew that there was two hemispheres, that the earth was divided like that, that it was dark on one side when it was light on the other. But he said there'd be people sleeping at the same time. There'd be people working in the field. Well, they didn't have night shift then. That's the way they, he was talking about how the earth was put together. Now, that's how smart the master was and how he taught us things. And when he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be, we say in the days of Noah. Now, I want you to listen to this, and I'm just going to just say a few things here about this, as it was in the days of Noah. From a, uh, this is from a historical, the historical works of Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian. It was written around the time of the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD. I want you to listen to some of the things that he wrote about. And watch this. He said, now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God he was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage that procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. Now, this was Nimrod. 
He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. Now the multitude were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod and to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God. And they built a tower, neither sparing any pains nor being in any decree negligent about the work. And by reason of the multitude of hands employed in it, it grew very high, listen to this, sooner than anyone could expect. But the thickness of it was so great, and it was so strongly built that thereby its great height seemed upon the view to be less than it really was. It was built of burnt brick, cemented together with mortar made of bitumen, that it might be, uh, not be liable to admit water. When God saw that they acted so madly, he did not resolve to destroy them utterly, since they were not grown wiser by the destruction of the former sinners. But he caused a tumult among them by producing in them diverse languages and causing that through the multitude of those languages they should not be able to understand one another. The place wherein they built the tower is now called Babylon because of the confusion of that language which they readily understood before. For the Hebrews mean by the word Babel, confusion. Now, the first part of that Listen to this. And remember, as it was in, in the days of Noah. Now, it was Nimrod who excited them through an affront and a contempt of God. Said he was the grandson of, of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. Now, as it is in the days of Noah, this was in the days not long after the flood of Noah. Now, right now, there is an ark in Kentucky. So that time is here. It's built to scale and proved even through natural means and, and natural things how that could have been done. Now, listen close. But also... Right now, there is a man, I think his name is Noah Harari, who is persuading men not to ascribe it to God, but to believe that their own courage is procuring their happiness. I you to think of that. Right now, that's happening as it was in the days of Noah. This Harari, whose name, if I'm not mistaken, I think his name is Noah. Now think about that, fulfilling prophecy just by his name. So as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So Noah Harari said we shouldn't believe in God. Or, or This was his words. He said, we don't worship a God above the clouds. We worship the cloud, the cloud we made, he said. The, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud. He said, we worship that cloud. Just like Nimrod and in the days of Noah. He said, in other words, we do not, he does that so that he could account, we would account and ascribe our own happiness to our own courage of what we have made as it was in the days of Noah. Now, Nimrod also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. Now we learn actions and motives. They are gradually changing governments into tyranny right now. They're gradually, you see tyrants taking over governments all around the world. And they're making it look like that they know more than you, that they're, 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 they're your source of happiness and so forth. But here is their motive. 
Listen to what Nimrod's motive was. He said their motive was because they had no other way of turning men from the fear of God. So there's a spirit involved. They want to turn men from the fear of God or the respect of God. And the only way to do it is to make you dependent upon them for all of your resources. Nimrod did this. This is what he did. This was right after the flood of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. There's an ark in Kentucky. There's a Noah Harari trying to tell you to worship what he's made, what the men have made. And the, and the whole motive is, is the same thing in Nimrod's day. See, my brother and sister, everybody, every generation thought they were the modern generation. Every one of them thought they were the modern generation. They knew more than anybody else. But nothing changes. And it says here, the, uh, even Josephus wrote, the reason he did it was because he could figure out no other way to turn men away from God but to get them dependent on government. To make them, bring them into a constant dependence on their power, on government's power. He also said he would be revenged on God. That tells you there's a spirit involved. Some, some spirit who wants revenge on God. If he should have a mind to drown the world again, or in other words, if there's going to be a destruction of the world, then he began to build this tower too high for the waters to reach. We see here there's a spirit involved, and these plans for someone would be avenged of God. So that means there's a spirit in, involved. And if you remember, when Joe Biden would come on the air, and then suddenly he began this bizarre whispering. He began this bizarre where he'd lean into the mic and say, I did that. I did that. I gave. And he would just be start rasping out this demonic spirit speaking through his vocal cords. And I I remember when I turned and heard him talk, I turned and looked because I've dealt with deliverance with people that needed deliverance from demons. And when I turned and looked at him on the air and him with his eyes would get wide and that serpent smile would come across his face. And suddenly I, would, I turned and took my phone and went up close and took a picture of him. And when I enlarged it, he had that gold serpent's eye. I thought Biden was blue eyed. But this is a gold eye with a, a dark, elongated pupil. And every time he whispered like that, you could see that eye. And then we saw Fauci with the same type eyes in his pictures. It's a serpent spirit and nothing's changed since the days of Nimrod. So what were they doing in the days of Nimrod? The scripture says that Nimrod became a mighty man. That word mighty man means a gibberim. It means he began to be a gibberim. A gibberim was a giant. He began to morph into something. They were experimenting with genetics. They were mutating genetic codes. They were crossbreeding animals, humans. They were bringing animal seed into human beings. They were doing things that was absolutely, totally, completely against God. And whatever it was, Nimrod began to do it and pass children through the fires, sacrificing children. And on and on it went. And the scripture said, as it was in the days of Noah. Now, look at this. We see serpents' eyes showing up. We see all these things. And now suddenly there's a new study out at some universities that, uh, that the thing that caused that the sickness that caused that, they said, has a strange resemblance and some of the same things in it as snake venom. Messing with genetic codes. They talk about wokeism and when what, what was that different than the serpent said, no, he knows your eyes will be opened and you'll be as gods. All the same things. This is the tyranny that's involved. And you're in the days of the spirit of Nimrod. You're in that day where they're looking to change genetic codes and things like that. 
and take over tyranny, but with one motive, take over with tyranny, with one motive, that they can turn people away from the living God. If they didn't care anything about God or didn't believe in God, then why does Harari, every speech he makes, almost everything he opens his mouth and says is we don't worship God. We can't worship God. We don't worship God. Why does he talk about God? Why does he talk about Jesus? And constantly trying to prove that they don't exist. Because they're no different than Nimrod. It's the same spirit. What brought about such a thing? See, people talk about things and, they, and we wonder, well, what brought about these times? What could have brought it about? Well, according to some of the other ancient writings and the Jewish writings, it says that the Lord wanted men to go all across the earth and take his, his message everywhere, to go everywhere that men could live free and blessed and enjoy their lives. But men didn't do it. They refused to do it. So when God's people refuse to evangelize, tyranny takes over. So it's the lack of evangelism and the willingness to go spread the gospel everywhere that allows tyranny to step in. Wow, that's something, isn't it? Now, watch this. Now the multitude, Josephus says, were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod and to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God said that you're just using God, in other words, they say now as a crutch. You're just using the idea of God as a crutch. And this Harari guy says, he's the one that said, <clears throat> you know, uh, gods, uh, men invented gods, and gods will go away, and God will go away when a man becomes God himself. And so they're start trying to start to tell you that, you know, you're, it's cowardice to lean on God or to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And they keep pushing this kind of narrative and pushing it. And if it's not so, why don't they leave his holy name out of their conversation and try to get you to depend on a cloud that crashes every other day? Can't even depend on the Internet. Everything they have starts to crash. And so they built a tower, neither sparing any pains nor being in any degree negligent about the work. And by reason of the multitude of hands employed in it, it grew very high. So they began to build their own way, their own tower, their own uh, everything to do for themselves. And it says, it grew sooner than anyone thought. The tower went up faster than anyone could think about it because all everybody was so excited to go follow Nimrod and his, his zeal to build this tower. And they said it went up quick. It went up very quick. And men didn't see any reason to follow God anymore. Now watch this. But the thickness of it was so great and it was so strongly built that thereby its great height seemed upon the view to be less than it really was. It was built of burnt brick, cemented together with mortar, made of bitumen, that it might not be liable to admit water. And so he said, when God saw that they had acted so madly, he didn't resolve to destroy them utterly since they were not grown wiser by the destruction of the former sinners. But he caused a tumult among them. And so this is what's coming. There's going to be a tumult among all the tech giants, among all these people. There's going to be a tumult. I watched the other night as, uh, as this guy, uh, Klaus Schwab, began to talk. And he had his panel, 
And everybody was privately invited. Oh, that's some conspiracy thing that just uh, uh, showed that, wasn't it, uh, Brother Robin? No, it was Fox. And they showed uh, him, him talking, and he's talking with his you know, standing up there and he's, he's beginning to talk and, and he tells everybody, you know, what, what, how they can make your life better and how they know more than you and all this kind of stuff. And they had people on stage who really know more than you, huh? It, it was like John Kerry. Oh yeah. He's so smart. He's dumb. And just sitting there on the stage, it's because they all had money and they had color-coded badges and they invited people with certain color-coded badges talking about all of this. And there was about seven people you could see sitting on that stage. I'm going to encourage everybody today because the Lord said to. I want you, if you don't have that book, The Pool and the Portal, you need to get that book, The Pool and the Portal. Get it today. It's not a very thick book, but it's a very, very informative book, The Pool and the Portal. And you need to read in there the segments of seven men that run the world and so on. Well, could it possibly be, brother? It rose up faster than anybody thought. And now they're talking about it. And on the stage with his seven-man panel, he talked about a one-world government is what the meeting was over. And Senator Rand Paul had to come on telling the dangers of a one world government. Now it's left conspiracy closets and came to the forefront of the stage. And we have a type of, we have the Nimrod spirit involved. Oh, wait a minute. Nimrod, what about this? What, what about uh, Nimrod? Well, let's, let's look at this a minute. It's amazing that According to, to sources in history, there was a leader named Nazi Maradash. Nazi Maradash. Nazi hyphen Maradash. Never heard of him? He is also known by another name, Nimrod. It's amazing to me how the name Nazi is compared, is connected to Nimrod. That's an amazing thing to me. So uh, what, 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 could, what could that mean? Uh, what did Nimrod do? Well, Nimrod was mixing genetic codes. Nimrod was uh, creating tyranny to turn people away from God. Nimrod was offering human sacrifice. Nimrod was, he was the tyrant that came, you know, he's the one that invented the mother-child cult you know, and so forth. I'll tell you about that sometime. I just don't have the notes in front of me. But he's the one that invented all of that, him and his wife, Semiramis, and all this, and they had their son, Tammuz, and, and, and you know, he was supposed to have died and, and all of this, and, and they understood. They, I think it was claimed that he rose again after three days and nights and so forth and all that. And where would they get such knowledge of this? Well, they got such knowledge, they, uh, uh, his wife proclaimed that she was the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 where the seed of the woman would come, so her son was the promised child. This is what they taught. And so it would be the mother-son cult, the mother-child cult. That's what it was called. And so everyone, and they had a host of virgins that would pray for the sun and the uh, 24 hours a day and so on and so forth. And you'd be amazed how it parallels the Catholic church and nuns and 